Oh my goodness, how are you, little darling? Frida Reba Darcy and Patricia O'Connor here on a beautiful, beautiful Friday. It's, uh, the weather is blue, the skies are clear, the air is really clean smelling. It's probably in the upper 50s. And I thought it would be a good time to, uh, talk about what I have picked up on my ponderosa pines in the time that I've had this guy. Look at that guy. And, and this guy. These ponderosa pines, both of these uh, are Yamadori. Both of these trees came from uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. I think South Dakota, Deadwood, South Dakota. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, so Shohin is uh, 25 years old. Elevation, uh, 5,000 some odd feet. The larch is a uh, literati. It is 175 years old. Uh, and uh, it was also collected at over 5,000 feet. Now, when I decided to start doing bonsai trees, I thought about what kind of boundaries I should have going in. You can definitely, definitely find yourself in over your head if you don't know what you're doing. So I thought, well, I'm not really too big on rules, but maybe we'll make a couple. Rule one, try to grow local stuff going in. If, you, if you're sitting at a red light and you can look over the side of the road and see something growing in the wild, uh, that might give you the break you need to not kill something while you learn bonsai. In other words, don't have more than one thing to overcome. Um, so, and that seems like a pretty good rule. My oaks thrive here. My uh, maples do a little too good here. They still don't know when to call it, when to go home. Uh, uh, they don't know when it's winter. My, uh, my uh, tropicals, my one little tropicals sing singular, does well here. So everybody does really, really well here. But whenever I looked at the map on the Ponderosa Pine, um, I was thinking about this guy and what it would be like to have a Ponderosa Pine. So I did a little looking and the map that I saw, this is it. So that is the area in the United States that is the region for the Ponderosa Pine. And I would be right here. The blue areas are all good. And then it stops being blue. And then all of a sudden there's a blue dot right in the center of where I am. It's almost like I drew a blue dot with a Sharpie right there where there's not. But there is. And then all of this area here, that's a valley. That's a below sea level valley in California. Uh, what they call the valley. Um, San Fernando Valley and uh, that guy would get warmer so that would be the reason and it's also a lot lower below sea level and that's why that that's why that dead spot and then over here by San Diego it picks up again so that was an answer to the question of I live on the cusp of a place that these trees will thrive in uh, what I was really concerned with and uh, my research has confirmed that it was, you know, and by say research, I mean, I'm watching videos late at night. That's, you know, but it doesn't matter if you enjoy your research, doesn't make it less research. But anyway, my little background work I was doing had pretty much verified some of those fears. Uh, some guys had been growing these uh, trees around LA and uh, some guys in the 60s were praising 
uh, how much, how great these trees were to grow, only to start having trouble with them later on. I think our climate change may have taken, you know, that little pocket around LA out of the, out of the mix, but a lot of the coastal area of California is still in play for these trees. Now, having said that, the big problem uh, is not, uh, of course, that they'll get uh, too hot. Where they come from in the higher elevations, they can see some ungodly temperatures, but it's the problem is they like, uh, like 27 degrees or something like that, like 24 hours or 32 hours at, at uh, 27 degrees or so. Now that's with some root protection because that's, you know, talking about maybe a, a tree in the ground that has a tap root. But um, you wouldn't necessarily want that clay pot to go down in uh, below those temperatures for an extended amount of time, uh, like totally freeze the block. But on the other hand, that's what they like. They like, uh, they like, uh, they need a couple of days of uh, below freezing to do a reset. And if they don't get that in a couple of years, they will exhaust themselves and die. But, uh, so that is something to be concerned about if you live in uh, warmer parts of the country. And uh, ponderosas, their bark does this really, really dragony scale looking thing. It's just absolutely beautiful to look at. And uh, you could just definitely see its years. And it will make these little, these little openings and sap will come out. And they're honey colored and it smells like butterscotch. Um, the drawback that people say to ponderosa pines, it, I say people say, I don't think this is a drawback, is the needle length. So I looked at this tree long and hard whenever it came time to get a ponderosa pine and I thought, can you love a tree with long needles? And I'm like, yeah, one, the size of this tree, the size of this tree makes it such to where its needle length to me is just absolutely fine. They say those needle lengths can be six inches. So we're a little off of that. That's a little below that right now. Probably a testament to the good work of uh, uh, Andy, Andrew Smith at uh, Golden Arrow Bonsai. He does fabulous bonsai trees. Um, so yeah, if I were not in the zone the way uh, I had been worried about that I might not be right there in that little bit of safety zone, I probably would have maybe look, looked at wintering them somewhere up in the mountains uh, north of here uh, for, you know, a couple of weeks during the snowy time. But that would have been, that would have been like rent a car because I don't think I can fit I don't think I can fit that tall tree in my Subaru. Yeah, you wouldn't fit it in my um, in my STI, I don't think, darling. You're a little long-legged. The little one, though, would. But I've heard of people making ice boxes for these, and I don't mean like plug-in refrigerators. I mean like coolers with some blocks of ice in it that they kept um, rotating in and out. And I also hear that the guys do uh, azaleas like that in Japan. I believe if I've got the story straight for the Coca Few show. Um, anyway, something they have to do out of season to have all of their trees looking right in time to uh, play with the big dogs for one of their big bonsai shows. So that's not something that's not known and not something that can't be done. But uh, it looks like from the amount of research that I've done, it's also not necessary. Um, aside from aside from what I learned from. Um, uh, well, basically watching some uh, Mariah live, Mariah live on, with Ryan Neal, and uh, and then doing some other ponderosa pine research, and some other people that I've talked to, as well as uh, the National Forestry guys. I did I did a lot of digging into their stuff, and um, and then some of my co club members. 
at the Oakland uh, bonsai uh, were very helpful. One of our one of our grower one of our bonsai people there had several and lives in the area and said, "Yeah, he's had his trees for uh, ten plus years." So again, the benefits of being a member of a club is you can talk to local people and find out uh, what other locals are doing. And so if you think that maybe you're having trouble with something because it's maybe not in the right region or something, it helps to know that other people are able to do that or if other people have been there and done that. But uh, Ponderosa Pines, they make gorgeous bonsai trees and you uh, they're a single flush tree and uh, you don't really do a lot of needle thinning. You might clear out stuff on the bottom. The way to keep the needles smaller, they tell me, is to treat them very, very well and to make them want to put out more needles. And if it puts out more shoots and more needles, it will have the same amount of energy to allocate to more and more needles and those needles will end up shorter. That is not a tutorial. That is what a one hour one hour tutorial comes down to. You basically treat these really, really well, let them do whatever they want. And when they put out a lot of needles, they'll have too many needles to be really long for the amount of energy that it has stored to grow those needles. So you'll get a lot of really short ones. And then later you can thin those out. So, they are a little different and uh, I'm hooked. I am, I'm hooked. Um, when it comes to American bonsai trees, these are like super easy. I mean, I would even say they've just almost got a little too easy thing going for them. These, I was worried about it. I was, I was worried about the climate and I was worried about the weather. And if we do, if we have like four hot or three hot winters in a row, I will have to, uh, I will have to be watching to take care of my Ponderosa Pines. But that's because I live in the Bay. I think if I lived in LA, I would probably have to look at getting my trees out of there during the winter, once every two years, someplace where it snows. You know, throw it, throw it in a box in the back of a truck and take it up to your whatever's house that lives up in the, you know, Nevada or wherever, Utah or wherever you like to ski or whatever and let the tree hang out with you and get some winter. You do that every couple of years, you probably get away with that LA lifestyle. Also, uh, these guys will take grafts. You can graft Japanese black pine or Japanese white pine to a ponderosa pine. The root structure will adapt to that just fine and with no problem. Uh, actually even better, the, uh, the root system is made to just like be a, be a water pump and uh, the needles on a black pine are like little water hoses compared to the ponderosa needles so they actually they actually you know <laughs> jump up in efficiency according to some people if you were to graft some black pine to that now if you were to do that then all bets are off on that so many days under 32 degrees you would be under the same rule of thumb that you would have for a japanese black pine so uh, that is another way that if you were a person who didn't live in a territory uh, um, like Texas or like or like other parts of California or other hotter parts of the country where you don't get two freezing days every winter then you might look at getting one and grafting it and if you have successful grafts uh, after a couple of years you might not have to worry about uh, those little winter those little winter uh, anomalies but they would always be there if you didn't and uh, I've heard between three and 10 years, but they will definitely, if you, it's like on one hand, they're in paradise. All of this, all of this good rain when they're not used to it, 
all that lack of snow when they've certainly been used to being treated uh, worse, but they thrive, thrive, thrive until they burn out and die. And uh, so that's pretty much a uh, my little spill on ponderosas. I think they make exceptional bonsai trees. I absolutely love my two. And I'm looking forward to increasing my collection of those. I might be a ponderosa person. Yeah, ponderosa person. They live a very, very long time. They don't have any records on these guys because they tend to um, rot from the inside out. So anything over 800 years probably is a hollow tree and you can't count the rings on a hollow tree. So they do get way up there, but we really, don't have a lot of information as to what way up there is. Plus 100 years, we know that. I mean, plus 800 years, we know that. So, yeah. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, I'm going to be teaching, or not teaching, but I'm going to be sharing more information as I pick it up on my Ponderosa Pods and my other bonsai trees. So, if you're new to bonsai, learn along with me. If you're like me and you just live in an apartment or you've got a small little space, if it's just any kind of space at all to call your own, you too can have bonsais, be they indoor bonsais or outdoor bonsais. And um, that's what we're all about here on our, on our little balcony. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>